you will take your Bibles tonight and turn to 2 Peter chapter 1 this evening. 2 Peter chapter 1, good to see you tonight and appreciate all that uh, many of you did to pray and help us with this morning in the service and uh, all that we were able to do to bless our first responders today. A lot of new relationships that were begun or built upon and grateful for what God did in our midst this morning. Appreciate Brother Stauffer and Brother Heath and others that helped us uh, with that. Um, just a couple things of note, and then we'll look at our text tonight. First of all, um, Brother Stauffer uh, is out of our church as uh, working with the chaplain's ministry and did a great job today. A lot of those uh, vehicles that our kids climbed in today and, and people that we were able to connect with are really relationships that he's been fostering, and so it was neat to see some of that come to fruition even since last year. But uh, he, we do support him and want to encourage you, there is out on our guest services table the black eight-foot table right toward the front of the lobby. Um, some of his prayer cards are there. I have mine tucked in my Bible tonight, but I keep it in my office just to pray over him, Miss LaRon, and their family ministry. So I encourage you, if you haven't gotten one of those, to do so tonight when you leave, and to think even of the other faces that we saw today and connections that were made, and uh, just pr pray, if you would, for the Stoffers as they're uh, seeking to pivot more into this in a, a full-time capacity and pray for God's wisdom and provision for them. Secondly, tonight, if you would make note, if you're a church member, deacon nominations are due by tonight. So if you have a man that God has laid on your heart or a couple that you know uh, God has gifted and possibly called to serve in that capacity in the new year, you can make sure you turn those in tonight. And as I mentioned last week, I think it was last week, don't feel bad nominating someone who either is unable to serve or in some way disqualified, not in the sense that it would be like, you know, juicy material, but just they're unable to for some reason that's uh, still a blessing just to see uh, you all affirming that and seeing in others uh, potential to serve in that capacity. So I invite you to do that tonight if you're a church member. Uh, and then thirdly, uh, Brother Moore, uh, Andrew had been praying for him. He was able to get home today. Um, he uh, texted me this afternoon. We chatted back and forth through text. He said, things are going better. I said I was able to make it through the night with no oxygen, and since I haven't had a fever in a few days, they let me come home. So he's doing a little bit better, but keep praying for him and several of his family are out today uh, as they're kind of processing that and uh, seeking to minister to the family. So pray, if you would, for Andrew, God's continued grace and strength there. All right, 2 Peter chapter 1 tonight. Let's pick up in verse number 5. So we looked at the first four verses. We're looking at this new series, Firm Foundations, a study on solidifying truths in the book of 2 Peter. And so let's pick up in verse 5. And besides this, and beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge, <coughs> excuse me, temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness of brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. For if these things be in you and abound... They make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things, the things listed in the previous verses, is blind and cannot see afar off and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore, the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure, for if ye do these things, ye shall never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior uh, Jesus Christ. So we looked at last time um, solid gifts, things that God has given us, and now tonight we want to look at this, a source of stability, solid growth. We're going to talk about tonight how a growing Christian is always a more secure Christian uh, than the one that is not. So let's pray and ask the Lord to help us tonight. Lord, thank you uh, for this day and all that you've done in our hearts and minds. Thank you for this assembly tonight, uh, the providential appointment that we have before us as we open your word and we open our minds and hearts to uh, being to be receptors of what your spirit wants to illuminate and apply and transform in us pray that we would not come into this text tonight looking for just information but that we would seek to to receive transformation lord as we yield to the authority and the application of your word tonight lord You've given us everything we need to be stable, secure, grounded Christians. And Lord, it's found primarily in your word. And I pray tonight that we would consider where our growth, or more specifically the lack of it, is contributing to our insecurities that seem to be so loud and overwhelming at times. And that we would draw great hope from the conviction you even bring tonight that we can change and we can grow. And we can experience that peace and that stability that comes with it. Bless this study. Be honored in it, we pray. In Christ's name, amen. Um, last week, uh, 
Brandy posted this picture of, this would be uh, Pastor Dave, our, you can't see it real well, but this is Pastor Dave in their front tree, in their front yard. And uh, Miss Brandy put this caption of the picture. She said, it's Monday at the Cotner's house. Uh, Timothy accidentally kicked his football into a tree. Mommy threw a volleyball to knock it down, and the volleyball stuck in the tree as well. Daddy threw a basketball to knock those both down and got the basketball stuck in the tree. She then ended, we resorted to throwing bricks and climbing trees. I hope your Monday is going better than ours is. You ever had that? It just, it just gets worse uh, as you go. Um, can I say to you, as it relates to growth, some of the reason that we often lack stability is because we're playing it safe close to the ground, listen to me, instead of growing and the root system that grows as a result of that. To grow to the sky, to grow uh, toward what God has for each of us actually deepens our roots. It sounds counterintuitive, but actually the lack of growth is why we're not as grounded uh, as we should be. Recently, I heard this statement, I think it is true, and of course this could be misapplied, but somebody said this, an often overlooked source of security and stability in life is change. Life is simply a series of changes. And I think where we get stuck is often we're not growing and changing in areas that God is leading us to grow and change, and as a result, uh, we have this hollowing out of our security that God gives exclusively to the growing believer. Now, Peter had a few failures in his day, did he not? The man who's writing this under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and yet he changed. It's amazing to me that Peter, who was best known for his mouth kind of wandering out of bounds early on in the narrative, is the one that God chose to preach the sermon on the day of Pentecost. He was a changed man. And much of his insecurities that even are still alluded to in the first uh, epistle of Peter, we see those beginning to be processed and refined out because the Peter of the gospel narratives is not the Peter of 1 Peter. And the, and the Peter of 1 Peter is not the Peter of 2 Peter. He's growing, he's changing, and we see this, this maturation, this, this growth on his part and the security that he has uh, in Jesus Christ. And so tonight he invites us, likewise, into that same uh, growth and in the, in the security that follows. So the question tonight is this, in a day of insecurity largely fueled by spiritual passivity and lethargy, how do we, in contrast, keep growing in the Lord? Let's talk about two expansions of personal growth that will lead to us being more grounded, firmly planted in God's Word. Number one, for a few minutes, first of all, let's talk about additional growth, the emphasis being on the word additional Um, I don't know if you were able to make it to the South parking lot after church this morning, but we had several vehicles, uh, some of our first responders that were here, and one of the most interesting was the Wayne County Coroner's uh, truck was parked out there, and it seemed like we had more fun with that than the others. Uh, Maybe it's because it's Halloween, I don't know, I don't know what the, trying to connect those dots, Nick was taking a tour and several others, and actually some people climbed into the back of that thing, you know, you got the dolly, not the dolly, whatever, the gurney or whatever, you know. And, uh, and someone said, it smells like bleach. And I said, you know why it smells like bleach, right? I mean, do you understand what this vehicle is? You know, we kind of had that little uh, galley uh, or gallo humor there for a moment. Um, you do know this, don't you? When you stop growing, as one author said, you start dying. And I think where we are insecure, listen to me, I love you enough to say this to you tonight, God's convicted me on it, is because we're insecure because we're dying where we should be growing. Living things are stable things, stuck things, uh, passive things are things that often lack uh, that security. And so we need to be willing to grow, grow, grow. Um, in verse 5, before we get into the list of these specific uh, things we're to add to our faith, notice how he begins verse 5. He says, besides this, all, right, all these things that God has given to us that free us and change us he says and besides this here's what you're to do believer giving all diligence add to your faith this is to be of utmost importance it's to be a primary focus every day every moment of our walk uh, before the lord it's a mistake tonight to think that salvation by faith alone means that one's faith never never needs to work it never needs to exert effort or diligence is the word that's used here in the text True faith sweats. True faith works. James touches on that in his text that we studied last 
uh, year. And so we see the effort that we must put into adding uh, to our faith. Some of us, I think, we think growth, spiritual growth, is just this organic thing that just kind of happens. And that's why we're so insecure, because our growth is defined more by just reacting or just waiting for it to occur instead of every day getting up and, and growing intentionally in these areas that we're called to add. In one sense, the, the phrasing here, Peter is saying, making every effort to supplement or to add to your faith. Are you also making that same effort? Am I? The word add, it's <laughs> interesting, the word add that's found here where he says, and besides this giving all diligence, see that word after the comma, add to your faith? The word add here is in the imperative sense, as in it's commanding. It's not saying, here's a suggestion, add to your faith. And if we do not yield to that imperative, we are in disobedience. But the word add that is here is the word from which we get our English word chorus or choreograph is kind of the, the feel here, or choreography, often used obviously in the stage or the drama, the theater setting. In ancient Greece, the state uh, established a chorus, but it was the director, the chorus, who paid the expenses to train the chorus, those who would fill the stage. This word in its, its vernacular in this day would have indicated one who provided for or supported another. He would have provided what was needed for the theater, for the production, for the chorus to be able to perform their, uh, their set, their part of the drama. In like fashion, the believer is to furnish, is to supply, is to support his life with these virtues. So God gives us faith. God gives us the benefit of that faith. What are we doing to supply it? What, what new fodder, what new uh, energy, what new uh, fuel are we giving to our faith to develop uh, this growth? I think for many of us tonight, we're praying for God to grow us, and God's saying, uh, what are you adding to what I've given you as a foundation? How are you stewarding uh, the resources we just covered in verses 1 to 4? All right, let's talk about these specifics just very briefly tonight. We don't have time to unpack them at great length. Let's talk about each of these words, and I think these are on your outline there uh, in your notes tonight. So what are some things we can add to our faith? Number one, notice there in verse 5, he says, add to your faith virtue. Number one, we need to add virtue. To our faith, each believer is to add virtue, and the idea here would be moral excellency. This is, this is high standard of, of what we're to add to our faith. We're to add to it moral excellency, this virtue. Uh, if you go back to verse 3, at the end of the verse, he says, the same word is found, through the knowledge of him that had called us to glory in what? Virtue. And so God has called us to add to our faith virtue. Living a virtuous life means living a life that is worthy of praise. It, it, it brings praise and glory to God. It does the right thing regardless of the outcome. Can I tell you tonight, there is a stability and there's a security that comes to the life of a person who says, I don't care what happens, I'm going to do the right thing. I don't care if it plays well, I don't care if, it under, if it's understood, I don't care if I even like it. I just want to do the right thing. And when we are pursuing and adding to our faith virtue, despite the outcome in the life of the person committed to doing the right thing, there will be a supernatural level of stability. I'm amazed how many times in our, you know, and we all have family, right? And family's fun, right? Can we say it that way, being nice tonight in church? Um, we go to work, we have neighbors, we have, there's just all kinds of, inter, the interpersonal dynamics are so challenging. It's amazing to me how often in those conversations we are not thinking what is the right thing to do. Not what do I want to do or what do they want to do. What's the right thing? The person thinking that way is detached then from the emotional chaos that often is a part of those interactions. There's a stability to the believer adding to their faith virtue. I just want to do the right thing. And as your pastor, I don't know if you feel like I'm unsteady or steady. But I found my best leadership moments are when I say to our men in meetings we have or in the church settings we're making decisions, I don't care what's tradition, I don't care what's trendy, what's the right thing to do? There's a stability that comes to our church and to our families. May we live this out, adding to our faith virtue. Where are you not pursuing consistently doing what is right? That is where you're leaking stability. All right, number two, notice he says, into that, to virtue, the subsequent 
uh, quality were to add, <laughs> notice, and to virtue, knowledge. So add to your faith virtue, to virtue, knowledge. Number two, add knowledge. The knowledge that's referred to here is not just intellectual pursuits. It is a spiritual knowledge that comes through the Holy Spirit and through a focus on the person and the Word of God. I'm focused on His Word. I want to know His Word, and I want to know the God that wrote this Word. Uh, that person, the one who is adding daily to their lives knowledge, is the one that's moving toward greater security. Can I ask you this question tonight? And I'm I, sorry to meddle. That's part of us preachers' jobs sometimes. God's been meddling in me on this list as well. If I were to ask you, just imagine this scenario. If I said to you your name and said, would you stand and would you quote the Ten Commandments for us? Could you do it tonight? Could I do it tonight? If I said, give me the Romans road, give to me, share with me how we should all lead a person to Christ. Maybe something a little more... Um, less like, you know, dot, 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 dot kind of memory. If I said to you, share with me the most recent experience that you and God had a meeting. God spoke to you. God revealed something to you. Can I tell you that it is our lack of knowledge, brethren, real knowledge of God and his word that's undermining our security. We know the latest news stories frontwards and backwards. We know what everybody has to say about those news stories. We know all of the trends do we know the God of this Bible? Do we know his word? We have to be regularly adding to our faith knowledge. Um, Hosea 4 and verse 6, the prophet says, My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee. We're being destroyed, brethren. Our security is being destroyed because we don't know what we should know. We're not growing in that knowledge. We're stuck. I know enough. I used to know. I used to teach. I used to learn. Are we growing every day in the knowledge of God? It's interesting because Peter, we mentioned this last week, but Peter over and over emphasizes the word knowledge. It's his repeat, repeated refrain or the chorus, if you will, of his letter. Back in verse 2, you notice he says, Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through what? The knowledge of God. Uh, if you go down to verse 3, According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through what? Through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. Uh, chapter 3 and verse 18, right toward the end of his book, the last verse, but growing grace in what? In the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Knowledge, knowledge, knowledge. To have a firm foundation, we must be growing in knowledge. So here's my second question to you. Not only can you from rote memory quote those things that probably at one point we all have learned, but what's something new you've learned? Not just those rote lists, but what are other things you're growing in? Is your knowledge increasing or decreasing? Stability uh, and security will trend in that same direction. And so the knowledge that we have that God has given, may we be growing in it. And for those of us who honestly would never want to say this, but we act this way as if we've arrived, are you telling me you know everything that's in here? Uh, we need to grow, brethren. We need to keep growing. And as we do so, the security that God offers uh, is more freely ours. All right, thirdly, go back to our text. Some of you are deeply offended at this point. All right, verse 6. I'm just kidding, I hope. Uh, verse 6, and to knowledge, notice this, temperance. All right, number three, add to our faith temperance. I had a funny little moment. Uh, I always double-check everything. Some of our, our sound people and otherwise always, Pastor, we, we've talked about that. You double-check that mic or that thing again. I've just learned if you don't, you drop the ball. And I walked. I was getting ready to walk out of my office tonight with this coat on. It's a little cool out there. Those, those of us were in the parking lot. It got a little, windy, a little windy there toward the end. So I had this coat on, and I grabbed a cookie off the table. Thank you to all the ladies who helped serve. We've had several meals lately, so thank you for all your work on that. But I had put my cookie, I didn't have time to eat it, in my coat pocket. And I was thinking, how funny would it be if I walked out tonight and I forgot that it's in my office, but it's locked, so just chill, okay? It's, it's not yours, okay? It's mine. Have, that's my prize if I get through the sermon tonight. But can you imagine if I, in the middle of, of preaching, just said, would you hold on a minute? And I pulled out the cookie or the, that's in the zip line, opened it up, and then said, could I just have a little snack break here, a little cookie break, and then we'll continue with the study? Like... Isn't there things we have to say no to for a time? Would that distract you? Would that, would that bother you if preacher, you know, pastor takes a few minutes just to have a little snack break? We, we have to say no to some things. We have to distance ourselves from some things. And that is true as it relates to growth uh, before the Lord. <laughs> Add to our faith temperance. Faith and virtue 
and spiritual knowledge are not enough for the Christian walk. We must also possess self-control. Those things, knowledge without self-control, virtue without self-control can get us in a whole heap of trouble. And the more we know without self-control, the more unstable we are, the more we can get ourselves uh, in a difficult uh, situation. And so this, this faith, this virtue, this knowledge must be checked by and tempered by uh, this word temperance. Don't we live in a day, and I'm thankful for the men and women who are here today, and I talk to many of them about just how often they're maligned and misrepresented and no one wants to do what they do anymore, and, and we live in a, a society of anarchy. You know what makes us and distinguishes us as, us as God's people? We, unlike that, we're under control. We don't rage. We don't react. There's, there's, a, there's a steadiness to us. There's a stability to us that is ours as we add to our faith. You may want to jot this down tonight if this one brings conviction. Stability and self-control rise and fall together. Stability and self-control rise and fall together. You show me a believer who is unstable, and I will show you a believer who is not under control. There's not a temperance that is growing and increasing every day. Stability and self-control rise and fall together. I love and I'm also convicted by the analogy in Proverbs 25, 28, where the, the wise man says this, He that hath no rule over his own spirit is like a city that is broken down and without walls. That's a pretty insecure place, right? If tomorrow morning has yet to be determined what attitude you're going to have, you're a very vulnerable person. If it depends on the coworker or the spouse or the kids or the neighbor or whoever, if there's not a control that's independent of the circumstances and the people in your life, you will not be uh, as stable as God wants you to be. And so add to your faith temperance. Peter here is saying, <laughs> a guy who had to learn this, didn't he? Self-control was not one of his strong suits early on in his walk with the Lord. But he's challenging us to grow up and to control ourselves so that we might enter into God's kingdom through this discipline of self-control. All right, next, look back at our text here. He says, to knowledge temperance and to temperance, here it is, patience. Number four, add to our faith patience. I was talking with Pastor Rands, who was with us back on our anniversary weekend. Um, he's in Toledo. And I said, are you seeing, um, some of you also work in the auto industry in some way selling cars or other things, are you seeing an issue with, with car lots? And the big thing happening right now is the auto manufacturers, they're making vehicles, but they can't get the, the chips that, that run the computers in these vehicles. Um, and he said they're literally in Toledo, which is kind of a hub out of Detroit and other places. They're just acres of trucks. Everything's ready to go, except they're missing the, the computer chip they need. Beautiful new vehicles, and they're just literally rusting, uh, as now it's been several months, if not a year or so. He has a dealer in his church that his, his lot has three cars on it. He, he, can't, he can't get new vehicles, and he's in a bind trying to do this. All this is uh, something being dealt with right now in that industry. I was reading this the other day. Listen to this. 85, this study, 85% of new vehicles purchased in the U.S. are financed. 85%, they take out usually a 72-month loan or whatever the case may be. Isn't it amazing how little patience we have? We want something before we can afford it. I'm not trying to preach against car loans tonight, but if the Lord applies that, you take that and go with that wherever you want. We're not willing to wait. And we're not getting better at it as we age. I, I don't naturally, as I'm aging, uh, in whatever you view me this, night, this evening, I'm not getting better at it naturally. I've got to work at it just to hold my own, to be as patient yesterday as I was, or today as I was yesterday, let alone to get better at it. And so patience is something we have to be working at uh, for the glory and honor of God. Uh, and so we need to be persevering. Now, the idea here is not just waiting for a new car or a used car, uh, as most of us probably purchase our vehicles. But you notice here that he's talking about the idea of perseverance. It's not just being patient on a fickle level or a surface level. The word here has the idea of staying under staying under something that God has put in our life, not trying to duck out of it or to, to, to let go of it, but to lean into it and to stay under it until God is done uh, with us in that situation. It is steadfast endurance, even in the midst of adversity. We don't give in. We don't give up. We just keep going. Um, 
I, I find this to be true in marriages. I find this to be true in just our day-to-day -day walk with the Lord. A lot of us are looking at and even considering quitting. We would never say it out loud, but we've thought about it. It's at least in play in some area of our life. And the moment that's in your mind, you're no longer the secure believer that God wants you to be. I found for me, and this would be true of the building we're in right now, and we're still working to renovate it. Something we'll be launching in the new year is working on some of the stuff here in our auditorium to keep uh, renovating and integrating how we use the building. But I remember when we were looking for a church building, we had several that fell through, and some of you were with us in that journey. And I can't, all I can say to you is gut-wrenching. We'd have meeting after meeting, go to an auction, get bought out by some big nasty developer. That, I threw that word in there, the nasty word, okay? Um, but I remember telling our guys and them telling me, we just agreed to this, we're not quitting. If, if there's a no, that just leads to the yes, eventually that we're going to find. We just determined we're not going to quit on this search. We need a building. We need just things we've done even today that we would not have been able to do without uh, our own facility. Just determining to not quit. Is that the mindset that you have? Are you looking at the outs? Are you considering, what if I bail on this? There is an instability that will be fueled and fed uh, by that mindset. Stability is only possessed by those who take quitting and fading off the table. I'm not quitting. Does your spouse sense that from you? Do your kids sense that? We're not quitting on God. We're not quitting on the local church. We're not quitting on whatever. We're going to see this through. That's perseverance. That's what feeds and fuels uh, endurance. And so may we possess stability that takes those things off the table. We need to be constantly reminded that the Christian life is a challenge to endure. Why does he say here that we need this kind of perseverance? Because Christian life is going to be tough. It's not going to be easy. It's not going to be healthy, wealthy, and wise at all periods of life. And, and so we need to possess and be increasing in this area as we navigate the real, raw challenges of our walk in this fallen world. And so add to our faith patience. All right, next, look, if you will, at verse 7. I'm sorry, the end of verse 6. And to patience, godliness. All right, number 5, jot this down, add to our faith godliness. A few more on our list tonight. This godliness is also referred, <laughs> excuse me, referred to back in verse 3, uh, where he says he's given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. In chapter 3 and verse 11, he talks about that we're to be holy uh, in our conversation and in all godliness. And so the value here, the significance of adding to our faith uh, godliness. This refers to piety, uh, man's obligation of reverence toward God. Um, piety, like if I said to you, they're so pious, do we mean that in a positive or a negative way? We tend to view that in a negative way. You know, they just, they're so pious, they're so... Why is that term fallen on hard times? It, it, it's, a, it's a good thing in the sense of Scripture to be pious, to be like God, to be uh, mimicking and imitating the God who has made us and saved us. And so we are to add to our faith godliness. Think about this tonight. This really struck me as I thought about how does godliness make us more stable and secure? Who or what is more consistent than God? Have you thought about this? So if God is, and Brother Heath touched on this morning, all the omnis, he's omniscient, he's omnipotent, he's also immutable, he never changes in those characteristics. So if God is the most consistent commodity, if we can use that word, or character in all of the universe, then to become more like him is to become more stable and consistent. Isn't that interesting? And yet, well, God, I know what you have to say, but here's what the world says about finances or about you know, whatever, family, how we parent or how we go through work or what ethics we should adhere to. In the moment we turn from God, we're running headlong toward insecurity and unstableness in our life. To be like God, to become more like God through this process of progressive sanctification is what produces greater stability. So to be progressively like him is to move toward the ultimate, the highest levels of stability. Here's the underbelly of that statement or the opposite side of that coin tonight. Our mimicking anyone besides God is going to lead to greater and greater instability. And that's why some of us in this room or all of us in the room struggle, struggle with instability, insecurities. Where you're insecure tonight is because someone else is the standard. Someone else is the, 
the scrutiny of your life. You're letting man-made policies and perceptions define who you are. Instead of God's the standard, his word is the standard, I'm going to let my life be shaped and defined by it alone. And so adding godliness gives to us a greater sense of security. God has never let me down. Has he let you down? The sun came up again this morning, whether I saw it or not, with the clouds. Every day, he's so stable. He's so uh, secure. And when I am insecure, it's because I'm out of step or out of touch with him. 1 Timothy 4, 8 says, For bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having the promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. That ought to give to us stability. That's what God gives us through uh, godliness. All right, so the first five virtues that we just talked about have more to do with our inner life and our relationship with God. These last two deal more with horizontal. Look back at the text there. He says in verse 7, and to godliness, brotherly kindness. So these last two will have more to do with our interaction with each other. Next, if you will, there add to our faith brotherly kindness. Um, the word here is the word phileo. It is, uh, we get our, our word Philadelphia from uh, the city of brotherly love. It uh, has the idea of fervently and practically caring for others. It's an it's a other's focus. Uh, that's the kind of love that God uh, wants us to be adding to our faith. Um, this would be the negative side. Selfishness and stability are oil and water. You make life about you, you're going to be the most insecure person in the world. You lose yourself in ministering to others, there's just a groundedness that comes with that. There's just a, there's a stability that comes. Selfishness and stability are the antithesis of one another. And so when I choose to love you and you choose to love me and we choose to love on these folks that God's always sending our way as a church and to your family... I'm choosing to be more secure. I'm, I'm choosing to have more stability in my life. When I push people out because it doesn't fit my schedule and my, my comfort levels on multiple fronts, I'm moving toward a position of insecurity. When I open up my home and I open up my heart and my schedule and my wallet and the list goes on and on as I do so, flooding into my heart and life will be a greater and greater sense of stability. The verse that came to mind was John 13, 35, where Christ says this, By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have loved one for another. And I thought about this. All men will know. That's a security, right? Doesn't that then include the person who is actually doing the loving? If all men will know that you're my disciples, that also includes the disciple who's loving the other disciple. All men will know. And if I can love you and you can love me, that only can happen in a consistent way with the help of the Lord. It affirms, it confirms, it produces stability in our hearts as we love one another. It just feels good to love another person, doesn't it? To sacrificially serve them in some way. There's just, a, whether it's a young little munchkin or the most senior saint or some random stranger we meet, just loving on someone else, there's a there's a security that comes in that because God's love is being shed abroad through our hearts. All right, lastly, notice in verse number seven, he says, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, charity. Lastly, we add to our faith this word charity. Whereas brotherly kindness, this brotherly love, is a concern for others' needs, this love, this agape love, this God-mimicking love, is desiring the highest good for others. This is the kind of love that God has demonstrated to us through Jesus, the gift of his son, the sacrifice of Christ on our behalf. That's the level uh, that God wants us to reach as we grow for him. And I will tell you, I am so far from that, aren't you? So why would I say tonight, yeah, you need to grow, but I don't need to grow. Agape love, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. His Kurt so eloquently preached this morning, the lost coin, the lost sheep, the lost son. I've yet to attain to that level of love. And so adding, 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 asking for God's help uh, gives to me greater security. This is primarily not a matter of emotions, but a will. It's a choice. You say, Pastor, I don't know that I love people like God. The question is not do you feel like he feels. Are you choosing to be what he is toward those? What would God do? toward your neighbor? What would God do toward your family member? What would God do toward that one who does not deserve your love? 
that gives great opportunity to love on them like God does. It's not a sentimental thing. It's an obedience thing. We ought to be getting better and better at it as we grow uh, in the love of God. It's supernatural. It requires God's help. God can grow any of us to be more like him in this area. I've mentioned this a few times. I've read different books on Secretariat, who was well-known in his racing prowess. He would have been the uh, winner of the Triple Crown back in 1973. Uh, after his death, his body was actually sent to the University of Kentucky for autopsy. They were like, why in the world did this horse? And he kind of was a randomly put together. He didn't have the same physique and profile that some of the other well-known horses of his day had, but he won the Triple Crown. They wanted to try to dissect that. And when they began to do an autopsy on the body of this massive animal, they found that his heart weighed an astounding 22 pounds. And to me, okay, that's interesting, but they, the article ended by saying the average weight of a mature thoroughbred's heart in that day, and even today, is a mere 8 pounds. So almost three times the size Really, the secret of the success of this, this underdog, this underhorse, if you will, that always seemed to triumph. Can I tell you tonight, brethren, it is our smallness of heart. We're so focused on us and our stuff and our take and our whatever, and we're very insecure because of it. Everything's a slight and everything's an attack and everything's an undermining of who we are. Our heart is far too small. And until our heart is expanded by God's love, it will continue to shrivel up under the pressure of growing insecurities that focus on our own limitations. We, it just shrinks, and it shrinks, and it shrinks. Instead of letting our heart be expanded, we love people, and we love to do things for Him that we can't even explain without His help and His love. That is where the secure believer lands. Now, may I say tonight carefully, uh, Peter here, and God is not suggesting that we kind of like create a necklace, if you can visualize with all these beads, okay, there's, there's virtue, and there's knowledge, and there's perseverance. The idea is that they build on each other. When I read agape love, that overwhelms me to go right from being saved to that. But these steps of incremental growth are what expand our ability to get better at the one that comes after it. Um, one author I was reading used this analogy each virtue helps us <laughs> excuse me, to develop the next one. They are like sections of a telescope. One leads to the next. And this expanding ability that we have to not just see God, but reflect God in our character, that uh, is where this journey uh, takes us. And so we add to our faith, subsequently, each of these attributes that help us uh, with the next one. I just, I've just found that when I have virtue that helps me in the area of knowledge. And once I have knowledge, then it helps me uh, in the area of temperance. And temperance leads to patience, and patience leads to godliness, and godliness leads to brotherly kindness, and brotherly kindness needs to, leads to charity. So just working at each of them, start with the first one. If tonight you're like, Pastor, I'm just saved, and I, I'm struggling to get beyond that. I don't even know if I am saved. I'm battling that insecurity. Can I encourage you, add to your faith, virtue. Choose to do right this week. And let that lead you into the next step. Don't get overwhelmed with it. This is a lifelong journey that every secure believer uh, is uh, pursuing. Now, this final thought, and then we'll move to our second point tonight. There are two ways that we often get stuck in instability. And I want to just challenge you with this tonight before we move on. These would be two ways that we get stuck where we should be growing. Number one, we're stagnant. We're stagnant where we should be adding. And this would be the profile of the person who is stagnant. And if this is you tonight, I trust God will bring this to bear in your heart as he has been mine. The stagnant believer has nothing fresh from God coming in or going out to others. There's nothing coming in from God. There's nothing going out to others. They're just stuck. They're just stagnant. And here would be the mantra. Old is all I've got. Back in the day, I did this, and me and God experienced this, and but there's nothing fresh, there's nothing vibrant going on uh, in the present tense. And so may God help us not to be the stagnant believer. The second one, and this is a little more subtle as we try to be faithful to the Lord, we're trying to be orthodox and faithful, it would be the set in our ways kind of believer. So stagnant, number two, would be set in our ways. This would be a person who has a sense of arrival or closed-mindedness in principle or practice 
uh, to the Christian faith. And this would be the mantra. Instead of old is all I got, new is always bad. Okay, someone's visiting our church. Are they a threat? Uh, are they going to undermine something? Is there, and, and new is bad, or the church tries something new, or we as a family, God leads us to do something new, and new is always bad. We're set in our ways, just preferences, not convictions, built upon the Word of God. And the other day I heard someone say this. I think this is very challenging to us. Someone said, some people judge you for changing. Other people celebrate that you're growing. Listen, sometimes sticking by the stuff is spiritual stagnancy. It's not commendable. And I think sometimes we view, I just, I do the same thing and I do the same thing and I do the same thing. Dear brethren, that's not always faithfulness. Sometimes you're just stuck in your ways. Are you growing? Am I growing? Is your preacher growing? Is your, is your family seeing the growth in your life? And if it's not happening, may we be very careful not to see as a character trait what really is a lack of growth and change. If your faith is only defined by what has been recently added to what has been recently added, how much faith do you have? Not what you did 10 years ago or what in the old days they used to think was commendable and achievable and whatever, What's today? What's, what happened this week between you and God? Is it growing? Is it growing? Is it growing? And if you lack that, that's where you're leaking the stability and security that God offers. All right, now let's go to our second point tonight. It's been a few minutes in verses 8 to 11. And I love how Peter shifts now to a second area of growth. Verse 8, for if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in, your knowledge, in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. All right, number two, let's talk for a few minutes about affirming growth. Number two, growth that is affirming. Uh, Brother Ethan was saying to me today, he went down to the uh, Ark uh, Encounter Creation Museum yesterday with his family. I'm going there this Thursday and Friday. Some of you are going with our teams. They're having like a college, Christian college expo. A lot of Christian colleges being featured there, and Ian, my oldest, and I will be going with Pastor Dave and several others. Um, and the Ark Encounter, um, they're just very gifted at getting the word out about the gospel. And I don't know if you've been to that. I would highly recommend it, especially with your kids and grandkids. But the other day, Ken Ham, who is the president of AIG Answers in Genesis, this is at the Cincinnati Reds ballpark. And he had the, so he, someone sent him this picture. I don't think he was at the game, but they're a sponsor uh, of the rain delay. So if there's a rain delay at a Cincinnati Reds game, brought to you by the Ark Encounter. And what's funny, if you look at the picture closely, it's a little hard to see on the projector, he says the Ark Encounter is currently sponsoring rain delays at the Reds baseball game stadium. Here's a photo during the delay. The rainbow was free. There's a rainbow, like right over the sign. Rain delay sponsored by the Ark Encounter. Isn't that crazy? Um, did, did God cue that up? I don't know. I, I mean, he did, but I'm saying I don't want to read into that. But isn't it just funny how God sometimes... He can just like make it obvious, hey, I'm here, and I'm kind of just manifesting and affirming what I'm for and what I'm against and those kind of things. Can I tell you tonight, as it relates to the affirmation that comes through go- growth, there is nothing, listen to me tonight, there is nothing as stabilizing as having heaven's measurable affirmation in your life. Like, can you, do you know God's for you? Do you have evidence that God is... He, he's, he's, he's working in my life. One of the best ways for that to be measurable is I'm changing. I'm not the same guy I was six weeks ago. I'm not the same gal I was 10 months ago. I, I'm changing. Look at what God's doing in me. There's a stability that comes. There's an affirmation that comes uh, when we're growing. It's amazing to be a part of this growth process with the Lord. All right, let's talk about a couple of areas quickly as we finish tonight. Number one, God chooses to affirm us with preventative maintenance. And let's look at these verses, verse 8 and 9. We just read verse 8, but verse 9, He that lacketh these things is blind, cannot see afar off, and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. God first affirms in our life this growth as we practice what is called preventative maintenance. Do you know what that means? Uh, We regularly have things serviced in our church building. Our AC units, our ground units that feed this room, that we don't just wait till they break. We check things. We, we work to prevent things. It's less costly to get out ahead of those, uh, those expenses. And the same thing is true with us spiritually. We grow, and as we grow, it affirms in us things that prevent 
uh, these risks and threats. Um, and so we cannot stand still. We have to lean into. We can't run away from danger. We have to lean into the challenges in our lives. And as we do so, it prevents us from falling into these uh, shortcomings that build insecurity. So here's the question tonight. If we don't persevere, what happens? If, if we don't grow, uh, what will be obvious in our life? Let me give you a couple subpoints under that. First notice he says, if you lack these things... I'm sorry, if you have these things, here's the preventative maintenance, they make you that you shall neither be barren. Number one, jot this down, barrenness. As we grow, it keeps us from slipping into barrenness. Only the life lived in fellowship with God is truly effective. You can do your own thing, but your life will end with barrenness. And the believer that is barren is the believer that is insecure. Where, where is the, where is, what's being planted? What, what's being harvested? What's being watered in your life? Is there a landscape of barrenness or is there productivity? And the Holy Spirit eliminates this barrenness and ensures efficiency as we follow him. One author said this, without the spirit and without this, this growth that God produces, we are shadow boxing or sowing without a threat. We're just wasting our lives. You ever seen someone sow without thread? How'd that turn out for them? You know, we're, we're sowing our faith, we're going through the motions, but there's nothing being produced by it. The barren life is the insecure life. The, the life that is not barren possesses a supernatural sense of security and stability. All right, in the middle of verse 8, he goes on to say, you shall neither be barren, here it is, nor unfruitful. Number two, unfruitfulness. Failure to practice what we know leads to being unproductive. Inflow without outflow killed the Dead Sea, right? Um, and so we need not just inflow of the knowledge that we talked about and the other things that we said we need to add to our faith. We also need to be productive. We need to be using what God is doing for us. The fruitful believer is the secure believer. Um, and so what it, where areas that you, <laughs> excuse me, you can pursue fruitfulness as you grow? God grows you not just so you look great. He grows you so that you can become more productive. All right, verse 9, he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off. Thirdly, there's blindness. So the third thing that growth prevents us from slipping into not only barrenness and unfruitfulness, but number three, blindness. And basically what Peter is saying here is whoever lacks the seven characteristics listed back in verses 5 to 7, he is blind. He is unaware of what is central in life. He lacks the discernment of true spiritual values. His value system is skewed. He lives in a world of shadows. Everything's in question because he's denying the command of God to grow in these things that need to be added uh, to our faith. I love that he uses this word in verse 8. He says, for if these things be in you, it's, it's measurable. Like your growth ought to be tangible. These things... There's a security that comes when I can reach out and feel it and see it and touch it. And if I'm not growing as I should, I lack those substantive, measurable points of reference that give to me security. And so blindness is a result. Um, do you catch yourself regularly saying as a believer, I have no clue. I can't even figure this out. I can't see where God's going with this. I'm not saying that shouldn't ever be the case. But if that's our only sentiment, is I, and I have no clue. My life motto or my contribution to human thought and, and processing is I have no clue. <laughs> that should not be our profile as a believer. We should have some knowledge. We should have some understanding. We should be able to see around the corner, if you will, through the perception that God gives us through growing in his word. All right, and then if you will, middle verse 9, quickly, he says, and cannot see afar off. Short-sightedness. I think this is one of the saddest consequences of not growing. We're short-sighted. You show me a person who's stuck in the next 10 seconds, whether they're being tempted, they're in an argument, they're in a, it's all about just here, right now, and what's right in front of them. They're not growing. A growing believer is always thinking ahead of where they're at. God's there, and God's leading them there, and, and it's not just about the present tense or the past. There's a, there's a future, and the secure believer uh, has that long view. Uh, short-sightedness is a sad symptom of the believer who is not growing. In contrast with a growing believer, a carnal believer is always nearsighted. Uh, the word here is the same word we get our word myopia from. 
that they just they can't see beyond their nose. There, there's such a limit to their perception. Uh, and if we are stuck in that mindset, often it is a result of not growing. We become so occupied with material things that we neglect the spiritual things. We can't see beyond what we can touch and feel. And so as a result, we live a very short-sighted uh, existence. I know people, and you probably do too, they live for Friday, they work all week, and they blow their, you know, I've read studies, they blow most of their paycheck within the first three hours of getting off if they get a paycheck weekly. By Friday at midnight, it's all gone. And then they get up on Monday and do it all over again. Isn't there more to life than that? But a lot of us in this room, if we're not careful, we're living that way. There's something beyond the here and now. And as a result of that, there's a security that comes. This is not the end. This is not all uh, that just meets the eye. All right, and then lastly, notice the end of verse 9. He says, this has personal implications to me, my own walk with the Lord. Notice it says, and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Lastly, there's a forgetfulness that comes. That growth, in a preventative sense, maintains out of our lives. Since his life is not evidencing the qualities of this man being described, listed back in verses 5 to 7, he acts and lives just like an unsaved person, and very quickly he forgets and even doubts and wonders whether he is saved. The truth of his redemption and of his salvation, it has no lasting grip, it has no practical impact in his life. As one author said, he's toying with the very sins that caused the death of God's son. And as a result, he's like, am I even saved? Um, And struggling with that. And I think I've shared this before in our church setting, but this is the verse right here, this text that God gave me when I was doubting my salvation as a 13-year-old. I've joked about it, but I would come home from whatever I had going, and none of my family was there, and they were supposed to be there. And I'm like, the rapture happened, and I got stuck. The heathen, unregenerate guy that I was. And I remember just wrestling with that. Made a profession of faith. I thought it was genuine. Getting into my adolescence years, as many of us do, they get saved when we're young. And these verses, God challenged me with, listen, it's not that you're unsaved. You're just a babe. You're just immature. You're talking and thinking and acting just like your buddies at the public high school or elementary, junior high school that aren't saved. There was no difference. There was no distinction. So because of a lack of growth, there was insecurity and so this forgetfulness creeps into our hearts when we're not growing much of the issues we have in doubting salvation really are symptoms of just not growing in our salvation and so may we press into that if we're truly a believer uh, we need to be growing let me jot down this statement we'll move to our last point tonight immature believers will always battle insecurities Immature believers will always battle insecurities. I'm not saying the mature believer doesn't, but I'm saying as in it's pervasive. Immature believers will always battle insecurities. So the only way to overcome this sense of insecurity is to reach for the affirmation that is only available as we grow up. If you say to me, Pastor, I feel so insecure, can I love you enough to say to you, grow up? When it's me, I don't like how they think about me or here's what's going on and I feel so insecure, grow up. As we grow, uh, the security uh, will come. All right, let's end tonight in verse 10 and 11. I love these verses. Ends on a high note tonight. Wherefore, the rather brethren, so Peter's not trying to give us a hard time. God's not doing it just to shame us or embarrass us. Wherefore, the rather, in contrast with verse 9, brethren, give diligence. Brethren, your brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you shall never fall. Lastly, jot this down, affirm with personal entrance. So affirm with preventative maintenance. Lastly, affirm with personal interest, uh, entrance. There was a crazy story that came out of, well, most crazy stories come out of California. Sorry, Josh. But this story was out of uh, Santa Clara, uh, Clarita, California, uh, of a man who lived near the Six Flags Magic Mountain. Uh, and they have like this annual pass you can buy. So for 150 bucks, he could buy an annual pass to this uh, amusement park. Uh, the reason for the story was not that. It's the fact that he used that pass to pay off all of his student loans, buy a house, get married, all with that $150 that he, he, he pivoted with uh, to save himself a ton of money. And um, they were interviewing him, this 33-year-old who goes by the name of Dylan, who said that um, the full advantage of the past, the main reason he bought it, was it entitled him to multiple meals per day all year long. All right, now, this isn't Ohio, okay, with our weather patterns. 
so he could get multiple meals without paying anything more than the $150 for the year. He worked five minutes from the amusement park, and so every day he would go there for lunch and dinner. And, you know, that area, you know, especially if you eat out, you're saving yourself. He said, I didn't go to the grocery store for two years. He would eat there every day. What was crazy about the story is, as of the writing of this article just a few weeks ago, he's still doing it. Like, he's married, he has a wife, he's got a house, and he's still 150 bucks a year. What's your budget for groceries? $150 a year. Like, that literally... And he said the only challenge he has is the, the menu doesn't always change enough, and it's not so healthy. So he was kind of, he said, I don't know if he was saying he added some weight or was a bit out of you know, where he should be. But this man found a way to get into home ownership. He found a way to pay off student debts. My point in using that tonight is this. Listen to me. There are things that we could enter into that we're just settling to stay on the outside on. There are things that if I were there and if I were where God truly wants, are we really as far along as God could take us tonight? I'm not. I drag my feet. I kick and scream. Sometimes I get ahead of him. Sometimes I'm way behind him. But there's some places I could enter into if I would just be willing to make the sacrifice. And so we see that this entrance that is ours uh, is ultimately only ours fully as we are growing. And so may we leave aside the insecurities, may we enter into what God has given to us. All right, two areas of that, and we're done. Number one, notice it is a place of sureness. Did you see that in verse 10? Wherefore, the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. There can be sureness, there can be confidence that is ours as we grow. We must choose to enter into it. Now, may I be careful tonight to say we cannot make our calling and election more sure than they already are. We're not talking about we're not in stable setting or relationship with God. It's, it's more on our side of the equation. It's, it's our sense of this sureness that comes as we are growing. The end of verse 10, he says, for if you do these things, notice we have to do them, you shall never fall. What's he talking about here? Obviously, he's not talking about perdition. He's not saying we're going to fall into condemnation. Now, we're not going to slip into hell itself if we're not growing. Um, the work of Christ has permanently and in a fixed sense delivered us from that. Rather, it probably and likely refers to falling into sin, disgrace, or here's the worst one, disuse. We're just, we're not usable anymore. We're not able to be used by God. And so as a result, God sets us aside. God sidelines us. God shelves us, if you will. Uh, because we are not growing as we should. There's a sureness that comes as we continue to grow. God grows and uses the believer uh, willing to enter into this sureness. What is the greatest uh, threat to us as a believer? I think it's idleness. We're just unusable. God uses growing believers. We don't have to be perfect. We just have to be growing. I don't think you expect your pastor, let's talk of this relationship we have that you're so kind to give to me, as long as you see me growing, I think you're willing to give me some room to do that. But if there's stagnancy, I would admonish you to move on or tell me to move on. Same is true of me for you. I can't expect you to be perfect, but are you progressing? Are you growing? Um, that's the, the benefit of growing. God gives to us this place of sureness. All right, lastly, verse 11. For so an entrance, here's the word, so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly, in the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That, that's a shouting verse right there. That's an awesome verse to anticipate. Lastly, it's a place of abundance. Did you see that? Ministered unto you, in, unto you abundantly, this entrance. It's an abundant entrance. Not only is there safety and constant spiritual growth and progress, there is also the promise of a richly provided entrance into this everlasting kingdom. Peter here is not referring to the fact of our entry, but the manner of our entry. We're all going to enter. Isn't that amazing? But I want to enter this way. I want to enter with confidence. I want to enter, as Paul said, stretching forth, leaning out for the finish line, that final ribbon as I enter into eternity. And I only can do that, and you can only do that as we are growing. The stable believer realizes that God does not desire just to, for us to just squeak into heaven. He desires for us to have an abundant entrance. And if that is true, then we are called to grow. You are called to grow. I am called to grow. I don't want to just eke across the line with an in, unstable, I hope I make it. I want, to, I want to enter with abundance, all for the glory and honor of God. 
And so tonight, brethren, how we finish this life and enter into eternity with God is largely up to us. Do you want to enter just kind of hoping and wishing and timidly putting your toe into eternity, or do you want to step into all that God has given to you and all that God has done through you? Um, that's what he yearns for us. And so our growth or lack thereof will largely determine whether we finish with or without the confidence and clarity we see in the text tonight. I end with this. Uh, we had, a, had the homegoing service of Brother Glenn last Monday, this past Monday, one of our sweet men who's now with the Lord and his wife and lots of family, and uh, pray for his family. Many of them don't know Christ, and we had the privilege to minister to them on Monday. Some of you helped us with that. Brother Glenn was right here where I'm at. He was right down front. The casket was open. The family wanted it open even during the service. So I could see Brother Glenn, the shell of his remains there in the, in the casket. And in my peripheral vision to my right was about a dozen teenagers sitting in this section right here that loved this man and were excited and honored to be here. Glenn saw beyond the present tense. I love that about him. He, he had pain, he had struggles, he couldn't relate with the kids, he didn't have a smartphone to share and swap YouTube videos with them that I know of anyway, he had a flip phone, we were always joking him about, but he saw beyond where he was, and can I encourage you tonight, for us to have the security that this man had, that now is with the Lord, we have to keep growing, we have to keep growing, I read this the other day, it's such an encouragement and a challenge to me, personal growth is not learning new information. Listen to this. But unlearning old limits. So here's my challenge. Where have you imposed limits that God never put in your life? Well, I'm going to serve until this age and then just kind of kick back. Or I'm just going to check out if, if the church grows beyond this point. Or if God wants me to do more ministry. Or things are a little different than I'm used to. Or whatever the specifics may be. Personal growth is not about new information. We have all that here. We got all the information we need. I'm just saying, what are the limits we're imposing? I'll go this far with God and I'll be flexible as long as it's within these constraints. May we be willing to unlearn old limits. And so Peter here, as he finishes this first section, he says, I was a failure. You probably have failed, but we can all enter into this with confidence and assurance if we'll grow for the glory and honor of God. Here's the question we'll pray Will you allow God to ground you with his additional growth? in his affirming growth. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for your word tonight.